All right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Well, thank you everyone so much for being here tonight. It's really nice to see your faces. Uh, thanks for coming to our Metro Phoenix Ecoflora one year celebration. I kind of can't believe it already. Um, please remain muted unless we're at the appropriate time where we're all talking. We're recording this presentation. So if you have any thoughts uh, or questions, I'll try to keep my eye on the chat as we go along. <clears throat> my name is Jenny Davis and I'm the coordinator for the project. I'm so very excited to share with you what we've been up to this year and also some really exciting announcements for year two. I'm going to start with a short overview for anyone that's not familiar with the project, how we got started, and then I'll dive into our accomplishments over the past year, followed by announcements for year two, and then I'll hand it over to our very special guest speaker, Dixie Damrell, and we'll follow her presentation with a Q&A session. There's a lot to go over, so buckle your seatbelts and let's get started. So the Ecoflora is an initiative of New York Botanical Garden. They came up with this idea in 2016 and in 2019 received a national leadership grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to scale this project up across the country. So recipients of that grant were the gardens you see on this slide, including us at B Desert Botanical Garden. Each garden has their own Ecoflora project and we're all part of an effort to bring Ecoflora to a wider audience. So Ecoflora is under the umbrella of the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance, also an initiative of Desert Botanical Garden. Our project goals are well aligned with and support CASCAs. And tonight, I believe we have both Ariana and Anya here, the two amazing women who run CASCA. And I wanna thank both of them for their support and encouragement throughout this project. I'd also like to thank Kim McHugh, Senior Director for Desert Horticulture and Conservation at Desert Botanical Garden for her support and foresight in bringing Ecoflora to the garden. I'd like to thank the marketing team at DBG for all of the amazing work they've put into this project. Our logos, collateral, some new things you'll see tonight are all thanks to them. Last but certainly not least, thanks to all of you. This project would, of course, not be what it is without you. So what is Ecoflora? Ecoflora is a project that leverages citizen or community science to collect data on urban biodiversity, specifically plant life. At the same time, this project is enhancing community relationships with nature around them. The project centers around three concepts, understanding more about the effects of urbanization, making biodiversity data available to everyone, and increasing the understanding and appreciation of plant life. So the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora is our local chapter of the larger Ecoflora project. So using iNaturalist, a web-based platform and app, project members make observations, and we look at that data to understand more about the state of biodiversity in Metro Phoenix. On the right, you see the top 15 observations of the project, which is fluid and changing as we continually make new observations. <clears throat> I wanna note that we're focused on plant life, but accept observations of all species because we wanna know about the overall state of urban biodiversity. So a really important part of this project is EcoQuests. And in addition to the overall project, we have these monthly challenges that task the community with specific missions. These are like hide and go seek games looking for certain plants or ecological interactions. And this is how we really hone in on specific data, we outreach, educate, collaborate with other organizations. Our monthly newsletter and our Instagram or Facebook and Twitter accounts also help us connect and communicate. Despite the global health crisis happening about two months into getting the project started, we've been able to shift everything to virtual. This includes EcoQuests and workshops and events. And seeing as we haven't been able to see each other in person just yet, we also decided to create EcoQuestions, which are short virtual presentations themed around the EcoQuest of the month. And these are presented by community members, experts, scientists, and are followed by a question and answer session. So we've also hosted botany socials and block parties where we get together to play botany themed games, talk about plants and the project. So these workshops, events, our YouTube channel and social presence have been vital for us to maintain communication with all of you this year and build the community aspect of this project and really the project overall. Over the past year, we've collaborated with some really wonderful organizations and community members. The collaboration has happened through the mentioned EcoQuests or EcoQuestions, as well as collateral and events outside of the project itself. 
So for example, we worked with McDowell Sonoran Conservancy Kids, which we created educational videos and a newsletter together. We've also provided foundational materials and video support for the Maricopa County Parks Eco Blitz. This year, we're also included in the Arizona virtual, the Arizona Native Plant Fest, which is virtual and will run through October. So these are our current stats. I pulled these this morning, so they could have changed this afternoon. But as of this morning, we have 225 project members, 145 active observers, and 968 identifiers. So looking at this chart, uh, we've had over 10,500 observations by project members in this past year alone. So about 60% of those are research grade, and this means that they go into GBIF which is the Global Biodiversity Information Database. So if we open up that category um, of about 1400 species, half of those are plants, we would see that there's about 670 different species of plants so far. Uh, insects are the second largest category followed by birds. So we've had almost 19,000 identifications which you might ask how that's possible if we have only had about 10,500 observations, right? Well, the answer to this is that observations can have multiple people add identifications, making a stronger ID. So you can have three, four, or five people add identifications to one observation. So at this time, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our top observers for the year. Feel free to make a drum roll. So the project member with the most overall observations is the garden hound with 1,336 observations in this year alone. The project member with the most species observed is La Rivera with 304 individual species. An honorable mention goes to Ocotillo for being our most observed species in the project. So congratulations to our top observers. Let's give them a round of applause using the reactions and I'll be in contact with both of you as we have special prizes in store for you both. So the EcoQuest with the most observations, aside from the very first one we had, which was basically a free for all looking for anything and everything last spring, was in October. Now this was called Ocotillover. We like to play on words as much as possible with EcoQuest. So looking for Ocotillos in urban areas, we had about 624 observations by 31 people. Now before this EcoQuest, there were about 400. So we brought that total up to over a thousand observations of Ocotillo in Metro Phoenix. Project member Donna Walkuski even did the math to figure out how many Ocotillos there were on average per mile during their bike rides. And they came up with about two per mile for a combined total of, I think it was 80 miles. So the results from this EcoQuest allowed us to see possible pollinator corridors and nectar resources for hummingbirds throughout the valley. The green dots are Ocotillo observations, and you can see how these possible corridors connect open spaces, supporting the necessity of these areas and plants. The EcoQuest that we observed the most species in was September, and this was native, introduced, or invasive. This was a collaboration with the Maricopa Native Seed Library, and we asked everyone to make plant observations and decide if they think it was should fit the label native, introduced, or invasive. So we had 126 different species that month, and the charts on this slide you can see show the differences in guesses versus as close as possible to the actual category of being native, introduced, or invasive. So we did pretty good, didn't do too bad. Um, in all EcoQuest combined, there have been a little over 14,000 observations of over 1,600 different species. So way to go, neighborhood naturalists. This is my probably favorite slide of the presentation with some of the fun observations that we've seen. Uh, there have been some really, really neat things, and I'd like to share just a few, which was really hard to narrow down from, you know, 10,000. <laughs> But to see more featured observations like this, you can check out our social media channels and search hashtag OBSOTW. I know that's kind of a weird one, but it stands for observation of the week. And you can see more of these things going on in the project. So starting with plants, we've had observations of what appear to be recent introductions, including cornspurry or Spergula arvensis, and that's right here. You all can see my mouse, yeah? Okay. Um, and then we also have Lassiopogon up here. 
We expect to find even more plants this year, and I'll tell you why on the next slide. So project member Tommy Gatz observed a trumpeter swan, and that's in the lower right, which is a considerably rare sight in Arizona. Um, he also observed this vermilion flycatcher on a no fire sign, which I thought was funny because their scientific name translates as flame headed. So they obviously can't read the sign. Uh, this is absolutely a tropical looking roseate spoonbill down here on the bottom left. I had no clue those were in Metro Phoenix until <laughs> we got going on this project, but that was very cool. We also have a sleeping bobcat in someone's backyard in Ahwatukee, and badgers were really popular uh, that were spotted near Cave Creek. And we also have this really cute photo of a desert cottontail hanging out with a bird friend here. And lastly, but not least, we have an iron cross blister beetle. If you see these, please do not bother them. They can release chemicals that can cause really severe burns. So they're very neat looking, but leave them be. All right, so it's time for our first exciting announcement for this upcoming year. We recently finished our target species list. This is a list of plant species that we have records of in Metro Phoenix, but have not seen on iNaturalist. So there are 1,440 species on this list. We want to know if these species can still be found here. So you have officially been challenged to find these species in Metro Phoenix. And I'll place a link to this checklist in the chat so you all can check it out while we still continue on. So we're working on the flip side also of this target species list with plants that have been seen in iNaturalist, but it appears that we don't have records for them in the herbaria. So this list will go live in March and we'll make that announcement and be sure to share it with all of you. So how do we create this list, right? Well, this is where our very special guest speaker comes into play. Because of the Phoenix flora, as well as other floras in the area, we can see what plants have been historically recorded here and compare that to what we're finding now. So the Phoenix flora is especially important to the Metro Phoenix ecoflora because it gives us a baseline of what had been recorded within a 40 mile radius of the Capitol, built, sorry, the Phoenix courthouse in 1997 to 1999. So this is most similarly, similarly matches our current study area for the Metro Phoenix ecoflora. So we base the list off of this data and it can give us a glimpse into the overall state of plant biodiversity in the area over time. More exciting announcements for this year. We are continuing EcoQuest, EcoQuestions and events, of course, and we'll also host in person when feasible, if we can. This year, we are co-organizing the City Nature Challenge for the Greater Phoenix Area with the City of Chandler Community Services and Recreation and also Educating Children Outdoors, which Kathy is here tonight. This is a global challenge that uses iNaturalist to see which city or region can make the most observations from April 30th to May 3rd. So this is the first year the Greater Phoenix area will be participating. We're really excited. We're going to be making announcements on social and sending more information in the March newsletter. I'll put the links to the project and the newsletter sign up in the chat. So you have those. Ecoflora will also be presenting at the virtual Citizen Science Association City Sci Virtual Conference in May. And for the American Public Garden Association conference in June, we will also be giving a virtual presentation. We've recently begun working with a graduate student at New York Botanical Garden to create a symbiota portal for the ecofloras across the country. So this will be like a sign up page for our ecoflora project specifically. We also now have an official website for the Metro Phoenix ecoflora and again throwing that in the chat for everyone. So that launched just this week and we're super excited about it. All right, last but not least, we're launching a merit system. I'm super excited about this. So we wanna give you all merits for all of your hard work and making observations in the project. On the left, you see the merit menu. So there's all kinds of great things like stickers and buttons, ecoflora t-shirts, books, gear, and even tickets or membership to Desert Botanical Garden. So observations that count toward merits are those that have been made since the beginning of the project on February 6th of last year, 2020. So merits will begin being awarded at the level you have achieved as of March 1st of this year, 2021. So meaning if you're currently at the 150 observations level, you cannot apply for the 50 or 25. So merits are for your current level moving forward, not retroactive. 
So the only exception to this is virtual badges. So you can see the badge right here with the coyote. Um, everyone will receive virtual badges for every level that they've achieved. And you can sport these on your social accounts or iNaturalist profile. The merit system is open to project members only while supplies last. So we have a digital form again for everyone to fill out for this merit system. I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. So you fill out this request, we'll confirm your eligibility, we'll contact you and then you'll receive your merit. So that's pretty much all that I have. We have lots of things we're looking forward to after laying the foundations this past year. This upcoming year will center around engagement and building participation and community. And before we hear from our special guests, we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break. So feel free to unmute and chat with one another and we'll be back here at 6.25. Very impressive, Jenny. Thanks, Wendy. It really is. You've done, you and all, you and others have done so much. It's so cool what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to try to catch up on the chat. Had a hard time keeping an eye on it. <laughs> That's cool. Kathy saw a trumpeter swan in Phoenix too. That's awesome. Spoonbills at the Riparian Preserve in Gilbert. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, I didn't actually see the trumpeter swan myself, but we did the yeah. Christmas bird count last year, which was the first time in since the early mm -hmm. 1900s that's been done. And um, actually, who, who did you say took the picture? Tommy Gatz. Okay, yeah, he did the CBC. Actually, he oh, might be the one that also saw it fly overhead, but he didn't get a picture of it that day. Um, so we had to fill out a rare bird form to submit with our CBC because I knew we knew they were going to flag that. They're going to be like, what? Trumpeter Swan, Arizona? Yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> he, yeah, they, he did a great, like, detailed report to send in. Um, so that'll be exciting because I'm sure we'll never see that again on the CBC. But yeah. <laughs> That's I've seen cool. a, an adult and a juvenile on the Salt River a couple of times. It's yeah. so exciting. I think Tom's here tonight. Yeah. I think I saw him pop in. I'm here. Hi. Hi, Tom. Hi, you guys. Hey, Tom. Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. I miss seeing you. See. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, I just saw your message. You really want one of the t-shirts. We have them in olive or army green as well. I like those too. And we also have, um, a. it's called a plamp. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but it's like a stake that can go in the ground and it has a little bendy arm and it holds onto the plant. So it holds it still while you take a picture. And I thought that was really cool. That's one of the oh prizes. Oh, yeah. That's cool. That is cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was neat. And you also get a uh, clip-on lens for your phone, uh, so you can take macro shots with your phone if you want to. Oh. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> That's an incentive. I hope so. I, I think I would have to quit my day job to be able to win <laughs> some of these prizes. <laughs> what, for the thousand observations, you bet. Yeah. Hey. I'm always curious to know if we can make the observations out of the garden. You can. Yeah, some people, a lot of people do. I mean, especially for things like birds, you know, because that's technically oh, wild okay. and, and insects and things like that. But yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of documentation in the garden. I was wondering about that with milkweed, mm -hmm. the milkweed project. You can do that? Yeah, I've seen a couple of people do it. I mean, preferably, we'd like to see what's out there in the yeah. city. Yeah. But I mean, it counts. That's, they use it. So, okay. The best thing it would be if you documented a monarch on a milkweed yeah. in yes, the garden. Please. <laughs> yes, that would be lovely. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> well. Kathy, I saw you have an addiction to patches too. 
Those are tricky. We were thinking about it. So maybe next year we'll see. They're pricey. They are. Yeah. I want them for my program and it's like, I want them for all of my programs and they're, they're expensive. We can be for sure. Hey, um, Jenny, did you see Wendy's question about the difference between invasive and? I did. Um, I messaged her privately. Give me oh. one second and I can actually pull up um, the EcoQuest article that we wrote and it gives all of that okay. what we considered. So let me pull that up really quick. It's back in the archives. That was a while ago. September feels like a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Two or three years ago, I think. Right, I think at least. Time is relative. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna paste this in the chat for everyone. This is the journal post that accompanies that EcoQuest, and we go into detail about you know what we considered native introduced or invasive. Okay. And Thank we you. went round and round about it for a while. So you know, we tried not to villainize anything or go one way or the other. So all right. Well, we're at 626 Dixie are you ready yeah I guess I'm ready okay I will introduce you not that you know half the room doesn't know who you are already <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our amazing guest speaker Dixie Damrell uh, Dixie's a curator at Clemson University Herbarium as well as curator of the Silver Bluff Audubon Center and Sanctuary Herbarium both in South Carolina while a graduate student at Arizona State University, earning her master's in plant biology, she worked with Dr. Donald Pinkova and Dr. Leslie Landrum to compile the Phoenix Flora database in 1997 to 1999. In Arizona, Dixie has also worked for the US Forest Service as a field botanist for the 2 million acre Tonto National Forest and established an herbarium for the Tonto National Forest Terrestrial Ecosystem Survey Team. That is a mouthful. She additionally worked for six years as assistant curator of the Desert Botanical Garden Herbarium in Phoenix. And without further ado, Dixie, you have the floor. Well, thank you. And um, i just like to say hello and welcome you all to my first and possibly last uh, Zoom presentation. Um, this is really kind of strange for me to be looking out at all of you. Um, I'd like to thank you and for letting me chat a little bit about my um, research that I did when I was a graduate student at ASU about two and a half decades ago. It's, it's incredible that it's been so long. It turned out that the project was one of the first electronic resources that actually focused on um, Arizona plants and re resulted in the Phoenix Flora database. This project really, um, the undertaking sprouted in 1997, and it was just a small part of the massive cap letter that is Central Arizona Phoenix Long-Term Ecological Research Study, or cap letter. Let's just call it that, shall we? Now, if I can get this slide advanced. Dixie, I think we need to share your screen. I'm not seeing it. Ah, hang on. Do you see a menu at the bottom? There you go. Am I there? You're there. You did it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Whoa. That was the toughest <laughs> part. You got it. <laughs> Yippee. All right. Well, back to cap letter. Cap letter is. <clears throat> it won't advance. Ah, good. Finally. Cap letter is a long term urban ecology investigation um, that focuses on the interactions between human inhabitants and all living organisms that share the resources and the conditions in the Phoenix metropolitan area and its desert surroundings. You know, that's a tall order and a long story because the uh, effects of human activities can fluctuate, you know, on these other organisms 
quickly over given periods of time. So in a long-term study like this, you really need a baseline. And that was our goal. The Phoenix flora was a baseline of all the documented plant species that grow in the Phoenix metro area and its surrounding environment. Now, you wonder, how can you do this? How can you compile this complete list of both wild plants and cultivated plants in all these different niches, both artificial and natural within this vast, vast area? How do you go about it? That's the big question. And you know, can anyone possibly do it in just a couple of years? So to kind of set the stage for these questions, I'd like to take you back to 1997. All right, do you remember back that far? It's kind of hard. In 1997, um, online search engines were pretty much embryonic. Okay? Google wasn't even out yet. And there was no such thing as Wikipedia yet. So, you know, what could your students quote, right, when they wrote your uh, research papers? But um, digital imagery was really kind of brand new. It was uncommon and it was expensive too. Do you remember a cell phone from 1997? Do you remember even knowing anybody that had one? Well, if they did, their phone didn't even have a camera. That didn't happen until after the millennium. Um, comparing technology back then with technology now, you know, we were pretty much in the dark ages, just climbing into the light. When a person did um, botanical field work back then, as it is now, okay, it was really time consuming and laborious. Say if you wanted to document a relatively small area, like a regional park, you know, it takes years, as you guys know. You have to go out, plants aren't like, you know, merchandise on a shelf. You've got to go out and find those things. You've got to hunt for different niches in the terrain. There are seasonal variations. And like 50% of the Sonoran Desert species are annuals and they may not even show up that year. So, um, oh yeah, you also have to ID the things, right? Everybody that's a botanist in Arizona knows pretty much it's kind of hit and miss when you go out and botanize, okay? So to reiterate the question, how can you um, generate a comprehensive list of all the flora in such a vast area over such a short blip of time? Well, two botanists at ASU immediately saw the solution to that question. Dr. Donald Pinkova, who conceptualized and compiled the list and doc, oh, with the help of some very older than average grad student and Dr. Leslie Landrum, who actually converted that list into a usable um, computer uh, database format. Now, Dr. Pinkova was a guru among botanists and he saw right away that you don't have to start at square one to do this by going out in the field to collect plants. That most of the material that he needed to get a pretty solid baseline was already right there in the institution in which they were, the ASU herbarium. And right here, I'm going to be preaching to the choir because a lot of you I know are very knowledgeable about herbaria, but just in case you don't, which I probably doubt, I'd like to say a couple of words just about an herbaria in general. Now, an herbarium, what is it? Okay, it's a collection of preserved documented plant specimens that are used to study plants in lots of different ways. Okay, you know, I remember the first time I heard the word herbarium. It sounds so romantic, right? Well, here's an image of an herbarium. You walk in and not a plant in sight. Instead, you have all these arranged cabinets. Open one up and you find it's just full of folders. You guys know, you've seen it all the time. When you tell somebody who's a new visitor to your herbarium, you get them to open up one of these folders. And that folder is full of specimens, but you have to explain it's full of specimens, but they're of only one species. This one species has been collected over time by different collectors in all different places. So kind of think of it as random sample 
sampling of one species of plant. Now, every species in an herbarium, as you know, has been um, accessioned and it's considered an important document. And that's important. At the time of the project, ASU had about 230,000 plus specimens. And I, I kind of think that's a hefty, a hefty number, you know. Um, at any rate, this next slide will be kind of everything I, uh, everything I know I've learned from Wendy Hodson. Okay. A specimen really is a voucher that affirms that a certain plant was collected at a specific place and a specific time. Okay. It's a piece of evidence. Okay. And in order to be a documented specimen, you have to go through an archival process. It's got to be collected, pressed, and dried, right? Laid out in a way that explains and defines all its important characteristics so that you can ascertain or verify the identification. And you know that fruit and flower are really important. There are sometimes some make or break characteristic that defines the identification. Attached to that is the all important label. Okay. Now, label information varies, but in order to have any significance to a scientific study whatsoever, you got to have those two things, right? The date and the location. You know, there's other stuff that's pretty important, like the idea of the plant, the collector, you know, but sometimes you just don't have that stuff going. No hard concrete rule as to what data is on that label, but everybody understands the general idea is the more data from observations that you have on that label, the more important that specific specimen is because it can be used by other researchers doing lots of different other kind of investigations. All right. So these days when you go out and collect and make your observations, you really kitchen sink it. You know, you put the GPS coordinates or map coordinates, you describe the topography. If you know it, you describe the soils, you describe the um, plant communities it grows in, the associated species. You describe the plant population. You describe things that you may not be able to see when you're looking at the body specimen that's on the sheet. Stuff like fresh flower color. How did that plant smell? How big was that plant if that plant was big? Okay. Um, what's the texture? Was it gooey? Did it sting you when you collected it? all sorts of things. Are you crazy enough? What did it taste like, right? Anything that you can think of to help some researcher in the future with a study that you don't even know anything about. Okay. But I guess what this rambling slide or what this rambling narrator is trying to say with all these pieces of evidence is really good in this case to think about your herbarium as being a big evidence room. And with any scientific study, or, or project, if it's a documented scientific study, it has got to have for every name in that project an herbarium specimen somewhere to back that thing up. Okay, now on to the project. All right, at the beginning, Dr. Pinkova um, designated the boundaries of the Phoenix Flora project by drawing a circle with a 40 mile radius around Really, the Capitol building was what he always told me, not the courthouse, okay? Now, this area took into consideration um, not only urban sprawl, but it also included lots of natural areas and regional parks, which was really sly, really clever of Dr. Pinova, because throughout those many years, he had directed lots of former students to do formal inventories of these parks. So where were the documented specimens for these little studies? Already right there in the ASU herbarium. Sorry, Dr. Pinkova. Um, he also divided that circle into four unequal quadrants um, based on road divisions. I remember when we were mapping the Phoenix flora, I guess you could say our mapping technique was a little bit basic. Um, to draw the circumference of the area, we used a thumbtack, a piece of string, and a pencil. 
I remember drawing the circle. That circle literally threaded Weaver's needle. It, it was kind of amazing. Um, to make the map in itself, we copied and taped together pages out of the Arizona Atlas and Gazetteer. Okay, lots and lots of mailing tape went in on that project. Um, that was also kind of a sly move because all of these natural landmarks, like what names of washes and peaks and what have you, these are the names that would be on the specimen labels. So it really helped us pinpoint the locations of our specimens in the different quadrants. The faux, faux, the faux flow or the Phoenix flora also had a cultivated component as well with the same general area, but the pie was divided into two halves in east and west. Now, really horticulture plants are the least represented in most herbaria, I guess because field botanists would rather be out collecting in natural areas. But a lot of our specimens came from formal public gardens, such as Desert Botanical Garden, as you can see down there. Uh, Glendale Public Library was another source and good old ASU. Now it happened to be that at the time, my master thesis coincided with the project. Um, my little goal was to document all of the vascular plant species on the ASU campus from landscape weeds, uh, landscape weeds, from landscape plants to all the weeds there. So I was really busy at the time too, doing a lot of legwork on campus, um, prowling the territory, collecting and documenting every species in sight to add to that part of the project. You know, I'm not a real geeky person, but I need to say a couple of words about the program itself. Um, Dr. Landrum's original program for the Phoenix Flora was really useful and I think innovative and insightful. He added a lot more search categories besides the quadrant one through four. In fact, he added um, to it all the names of the natural areas and the regional parks. So that when you were doing the databasing, and this is a hard copy of the Phoenix Flora, uh, thanks to Ginny sent me, um, you would look at your specimen and see, oh yeah, the specimen is in quadrant one. So I'll put a check there. Oh, but it's also in white tanks. So I'll put a check there. Or the same for quadrant two in the McDowell Mountains or for four in Sierra Estrellas and so on and so forth. So we had a real uh, line of places that we could document the McDowell's, White Tanks, Lake Pleasant and so on and so forth. He also added another search category for the origin, which was for um, native down here, native and adventitious, you know, introduced plants and also for growth forms. So you also uh, noted if it was a tree, a small tree, a little bitty tree, a teeny, no, actually just trees, shrubs, sub shrubs, vines, perennial, annual herbs, bulbs, you know, in my mind, I don't remember it being this detailed, but I'm sure that it was. But because he did this with the different categories, it, it was kind of cool because you could query the database in lots of different ways. Say you wanted to know um, for quadrant four, um, what shrubs are in quadrant four, you could just query it and it would spin you out a whole list of all the shrubs there. And that was cool, but you could also do fancy stuff with it. And you could ask it something like, okay, what introduced annuals are in these Sierra Estrellas in South Mountain, but aren't in white tanks? Okay, so you could really maneuver this database around for, you know, ecological studies. And I thought that was pretty cool. Now that search um, uh, feature, unfortunately, didn't transfer over and it was lost when they converted the converted the Phoenix flora to the um, SignNet um, uh, format. And that's too bad. I really like that. I thought that was cool. But, you know, I thought it was worth mentioning. All right. So let's get back to the beginning. We started searching for specimens instead of live plants. And me and Dr. Pinkova, we went through every single cabinet in that herbarium, pulling out specimens 
that fit into the project. We'd examine them. It's my little duty to write down the species and write down the location, fill out all these other categories, the common name, origin and growth habit. Now this, we did this for two years. And you know, this might sound tedious to some people, but I cannot express to you how much fun I had that entire time. Dr. Pinkova was amazing and held me spellbound with his plant knowledge and his stories about the plants, all of the places and all of the collectors there. I mean, maybe twice a week we do this and it was story time every day. Uh, it was really a gift and I, I really feel lucky to have been able to be part of it. We also had a very lucky break, I should say, near the beginning of the project when Pinkova contacted his former student, Wendy Hudson. At that time, she was a curator of the Desert Botanical Garden Herbarium. And Wendy was actually eager to include that collection in with the Phoenix flora. And this was such a coup. This meant at least 40,000 more specimens to do that would really enrich that flora, both components, the, the cultivated and the native plants. Plus it kind of included the perk of getting to go to the garden once a week and talk around and clown around with Wendy and the late great uh, Ted Anderson and lots of the really uh, intelligent and, and hilarious uh, volunteers that work out in the garden. That was, that was really, really fun. Okay, now toward the second half of the project, we had another kind of break. We discovered that we had a hole in our data, that quadrant three or Q3 is kind of the dieters portion of the pie, really had a dearth. I mean, the land in Q3 was more or less agricultural and evidently not very appealing to collectors of plants because we just didn't we just didn't have much stuff from there. It did have one significant natural area, which was the Santan Mountain Regional Park. But that particular park had no floristic inventory. So with a push from the gurus, okay, I began field work and documenting the Santan Park. So now, hooray, it's time to leave the herbarium and get to adventures in the field. Well, Santans was about 10,000 acres south of the town of Queen Creek. And basically, it's a series of low desert mountains and basins. Here's the gold mines in the north. In the south, you have some um, sheer prominences like the Malpai Hills. Did I say that was Malpai? That's the gold mines. Here are the Malpai Hills and they're in the south. It had its share of creosote and versage flats, but it all had, so it had slopes and slopes of basically the uh, brittle bush monocultures. And those were results from arson fires set back in the early, I guess the early 1990s. I mean, it's funny to realize that a fire can do something like that. I think they say, that these big colonies of brittle bush sometimes persist for decades. You can see we had washes, but we don't have any water back there. It's really dry. But when you're doing a plant inventory, it's really all about finding niches, isn't it? I mean, you hunt different niches the same way you hunt the different plant species. So I remember roping in lots of friends, uh, family, colleagues, anybody I could to help me get up there and look around the sand tans, we'd find ourselves picking our way up those sheer walls of the Malpais, trying to get to those volcanic rhyolite outcrops where you could actually document rhyolite bush, Crossosoma biglovia. And I kind of think that that is a cool thing when you actually find a common name that is helpful to a botanist, actually do something, find something. I don't know how many times we scuttled down um, alluvial fans, you know, uh, documenting and collecting things like ocotillos and um, saguaros and hedgehogs or barrels like these uh, Ferrocactus cylindraceus, which was a predominant cactus up in the gold mine uh, mountains, the north part of the park. Or how many times 
we slog down uh, sandy washes looking for something, okay? But I do remember we filled our shoes every time we slushed down there. And one very, very hot day, probably the hottest day of the year, um, we went down there. We were looking around. I don't know why. You know, we must have been desperate to get out. But we were down there and I heard this big vibration. Okay. It's like, whoa, what is that? So we went on a little bit and we came upon this shrub, this uh, columbrina or Californica or Las Animas uh, naked wood. And this shrub was in full bloom, but it was coated in bees and all sorts of pollinators. I think that's the first time, maybe the only time in my career that I've found, uh, discovered a plant by sound, right? I do not know how we collected from that plant. I mean, there were lots of insects with stingers, but you know how it is out in the desert when it's really, really hot. It's almost like more of my, like a mirage than it's something that actually happened. But this was a real significant find because it was the only place within that Phoenix flora um, circumference that um, we documented that particular species. Now, most of what we found in the sand tans, you know, was where it was supposed to be, you know, native plants. But of course, you know, by doing all of your studies and all of your inventories, it is really important to document those introduced species. The sand tan um, species count in, was like 10% introduced species. And most of it really was stuff that was, you could find introduced in the neighboring mountains like South Mountains. Now and again, you're gonna find a little bit of a surprise. One day, I can remember walking down a kind of a worn Jeep path. We found this little bitty cannabis plant growing on the side of the road, you know. There was just enough of the plant to make a specimen. No leftovers, right? Or another day we found a colony of Opuntia microdaces, bunny ear cactus, you know, growing in this nice little colony. Well, you know, there's not much danger really for marijuana to proliferate and swarm the sand tans. But that little cactus colony actually persisted for about four years. And given the right conditions, who knows with climate change, right? That thing could have uh, proliferated and spread and become quite a warren. So it goes to show you never know. All right. Well, when we started our Santan inventory, it was the spring after a soaking um, El Nino winter. Santan's got 10 inches of rain that year. And really, the ephemerals were so abundant. It looked nothing like the picture in the center, right? That was taken two years after. But I want you to take a look at that olive colored column and check out the species count. 139 of the species were ephemeral. I mean, that's over 58%. So it just illustrates, you know, the importance of timing if you're going to do a, a floristic inventory in the desert. So when all was said and done, really, the Santan inventory increased the species count of Q3 by 70%. But as you know, not all adventures happen out, happen out in the so-called field. Sometimes the hunt for plant will take you to the throbbing irrigated heart of the urban landscape. Now, I know more than just one botanist that will insist that documenting plants in an urban setting, it kind of lacks the thrill of discovery or exploration. And it's not as important as documenting um, wild plant out in the boonies. Well, you know what they say about opinions. Um, I think the urban landscape is full of, it's like a maze of different niches really. They can grow all sorts of plants. And I, I, I personally think it's full of potentially uh, interesting and certainly maybe important discoveries. 
So you take an urban setting like this. Um, you can have native plants in a landscape planted right aside introduced horticultural plants. You can also have, if you're willing to look for them, unintended introduced weeds, okay? Just kind of hiding in plain sight, waiting to become a nuisance. You can have um, deliberately planted horticultural plants, that, introductions that have their own ideas on where they wanna grow or where they wanna send their children. Or right in the middle of this thing, you can have unintended native plants just popping up out of nowhere, just to prove that this game. So when I was um, hunting the 700 acres of the um, Arizona State campus, you know, I not only had to hunt to go look at, at different rose displays or showcase walkways in front of campus buildings, but my hunt all was, it also took me scrounging in alleyways behind dorms. It took me snooping between parking lots. It took me stealing little samples in the children's vegetable garden, digging between two different atria, and me climbing over locked gates of the Desert Harbor Union Park. It had me pilfering plants from Danforth Chapel Garden, and so on and so forth. But I guess what I want to say is, the 908 tax account, you know, that really stands for a lot of exploration. I know the count should be high. It's a garden with irrigation. It's got water. But hiking up that number, really, you do have a chance to explore. You do have a chance to discover interesting stuff. And to kind of wrap up this presentation, I just want to talk about two interesting finds on campus. All right, the first one was one that I found when I was skulking behind Okatillo Hall, okay, off Apache Boulevard. Now, this was an old dorm that used to be where the Vista del Sol villas are now. And I found a papaya, that is Carica papaya, and it was in full bloom. It's a, a tree-like tropical plant, okay. And at the time I found it, it was about, oh, 12 feet tall. Now, you get something like that, and it's an unusual plant, you know, finding it at any time, but it was a plant that was also growing in an unusual circumstance. This plant was squeezed into this thin strip of pebbled earth, okay, right next to kind of an access walkway sandwich between the back of a dormitory an up close and personal brick wall, okay? It was a shaded area of concrete. I think that the, you know, the walkway probably was just one to give access to either the utilities or maybe the drip system, you know, of drip irrigation, something like that. But this was not the kind of place you'd be hanging out. You might go there to take your garbage out or maybe to botanize, right? But, you know, it was just a weird place. But anywho, you know, I collected and documented this plant. And, you know, as a native cult, I mean, as a cultivar plant, right? I mean, here you got this big tree. But, you know, just lately, and I mean, you know, months ago, I've started thinking about this thing and, and reconsidering. Okay. I love papaya. I've done a little bit of research on its growth rate. And did you know that a papaya seed can germinate in less than two weeks and can grow to maturity in uh, as little as five months? That's pretty impressive. Now, I've been trying to work backwards from the specimen um, on the 31st of December. And to me, it is really plausible that some wayward seed was germinated what maybe by monsoons maybe by a leaky pipe maybe by a drippy irrigation system germinated and shot up to maturity all on its own especially in such a, a sheltered area you know i've got other circumstantial evidence okay you know papayas are dioecious plants you know they're all male or all female flowers on each separate plant 
Now, if you really intend to grow fruit, you need a mom and a pop to make a fruit, right? Well, who's going to plant just one lone papaya unless you have some kind of tweaked out um, uh, cultivar that's a selfing cultivar? But generally, those selfing cultivars have much bigger flowers. If you check out the top of the specimen, you have these little bitty, little bitty flowers right up there. Yeah. So to me, I, I just think it's highly unlikely that somebody would intentionally plant a plant like that. So I've rescinded the um, title of cultivated plant, and now I'm ready to call this ASU's most interesting weed. I truly am. Now my last slide. And the wrap up basically of this pleasant presentation is um, another thing that I found in a desert display on the southwest corner of the student services building. And the plant was really an inconspicuous shrub that you might pass by any day unless you, you know, opened up your eyes and took a look at the trunk and the lower branches. It was fragrant bursa or bursa phagoroides. And uh, you know, you knowledgeable people probably know that Bursera is an incense plant, right? Comifera and Boswellia, frankincense and myrrh are in that family. So if you take your thumbnail and scratch just a little twig of it, it's going to exude this pungent tangerine scented oil. It's really good. Now, most Arizona plant lovers, you know, are aware of elephant tree, the other Bursera that grows up on South Mountain. But a lot of them have never even heard of this particular species that's also an Arizona native. Um, well, with good reason, really. The only documented population in, in the US uh, happens to be up there on the Bavoquivari Mountains, Fema County. So unless you hike up there or somewhere in Mexico, you probably wouldn't have run into it. Um, but it's really a cool plant. I remember when I documented this thing, um, I used a branch that the ASU landscape had trimmed off, okay, so I had enough for the specimen and I had, you know, enough of the branch left over to make a couple of cuttings and they actually rooted and I was so excited and they actually flowered actually, actually, actually. Um, this was a plant that I kind of developed a personal relationship with and I would visit this plant when I had, you know, business over there. Um, one day when I was looking at my plant, okay, I noticed something. There was a rock at the base of the plant. It'd been there for a while, but you know, I never really paid too much attention to it. But I noticed it had these weird grooves on it. So I picked it up and I took a look at it and realized it was a hand carved uh, statuette. Okay of a person in meditation and it's like, oh my gosh, this is probably a shrine offering. Woo so I kind of carefully put it back in place where I found it. But to me, um, there is a mystery to this particular plant, okay? Obviously, it's an established bed, you know? Um, and the plant itself is a mature plant. Now, where did this plant come from? It's not the kind of plant that you're going to have found in a nursery somewhere. I always think that, that maybe some prof in ASU early days might have brought it in or something. So I thought, well, I'm curious. I'll go ask the people that manage the ASU Arboretum about this plant. They didn't even know that the plant was there, much less who planted it. Hey, and neither did Dr. Pinkova. So, well, with that mystery, I'm going to end this presentation. And um, if you have any questions or you have any comments about this, I'd be glad to try to answer them. And I'd just like to thank you very much for sitting through this. Thank you so much, Dixie. That's such fascinating stuff. I feel like we have it easy for the Metro Phoenix Eco Floor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would, I would love to do the the the, the eco floor. I would think that that would be a blast. <laughs> We're having fun so far, yeah. I this makes me really even more excited to see what we can find in urban areas and the stories that you've told behind just those two last plants, even more so, and just seeing those types of things is really exciting. 
So we've got about uh, 10 minutes for question and answer. Feel free to type questions in the chat or if you want to unmute and ask verbally, you're welcome to. Don't see anyone typing anything in the chat yet, but if you'd also just like to chat with Big Sue for a minute, we've got the time, so have at it. Hi. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I didn't raise my hand or anything. Um, oh, uh, Deb Sparrow here. I just, uh, Dixie, hi, nice to see hey. you. Hey, how are you, Deb? Okay, it's been a long time. Ages. My computer, uh, I've had some problems with it and it cut out just after you were saying that you realized that the, that that bursera had a little shrine thing going on there so, oh it was just drive me crazy so I'm I'm glad I got tuned back into you guys but um there are uh, are you aware you probably are there on campus at ASU Tempe campus where college jet ends on the south side of campus there are three bursaras mature and larger than you ever see them, Macrophylla, Phagroides, and Hensiana. Wow! And at least one or one, at least one of them is labeled. Now, mm -hmm. the Phagroides doesn't look like. I mean, I, the Phagroides I know are little guys, you know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it doesn't. Look, and these are like these are shade trees. Small wow. shade trees, but you know, people taller than you and me can stand under them. You know. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, know when they brought them in, Deb? That's what I'm wondering. I haven't yet found someone who knows. I I, I know somebody who's managed, um, who's had, had some hand in managing plants over there, but in recent times, and this these I've been there a very, very long time. And it would be really interesting to know more about that. There was recently construction near there and the Thagroides had a big, ugly thing, thing happened to it, but it's still there and, you know, um considering i guess it's all right but it's just amazing i mean there's enough enough uh, um hardscape around there that they didn't frost prune wow so i just i, I thought i'd just see if somebody here knows or becomes aware of it perhaps they can share that it, it's pretty pretty interesting well that's that's fascinating i mean i i know it wasn't there when i when i did my floor i you know I would just love to see it. I know I've run into uh, Bursera hindisiana um, in some locations in, in, in Tucson, and they yeah. use it in a, like, as a street tree, you know, in kind of those hell strips, the little strips of land between the sidewalk and, and, the, and the street. And, you know, they seem to be, you know, really, you know, adaptive to at least to the Tucson metro area. But it's, it's always, I'm really thrilled to see that particular uh, a genus. I mean, what a cool plant. Yeah, yeah I got That's a bunch great. in pots and they, they're getting pretty big just in a pot, but I haven't seen that in a street tree. Anyhow, I just thought I'd see. Um, thank you for doing this with us. Well, you know, what a pleasure. I didn't know I would have so many esteemed people that, that, that I know and care so much about <laughs> be actually here. We've got uh, Wendy in the chat that I knew Dixie's project was big, but I never really appreciated how big. Not only having to do a huge flora of Phoenix, including cultivated plants, but another flora done to be part of the big flora. Unusual and really impressive. Dixie proves well there should be no biases in plant collecting. Great specimens and great labels too. And she also said, when are you coming back to visit us? Oh, I wish I could come back in two minutes. I, you know, I'm often find myself very homesick um, for where we used to live in Arizona. You know, it's nice here. There are four seasons and yada, yada, yada. But you know how it is when you kind of, uh, what, imprint in the desert. You just, you want to come back to that light, that beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, have all you guys gotten your uh, COVID vaccinations? Working on it. <laughs> I haven't gotten mine either, but I, I'm hoping when the world is a little bit better, a little bit healthier, you know, I can shake the, you know, dust off my shoes and actually go back down, go back home. So yes, we all miss you, and uh, whenever you can make it back, you just let us know and uh, <laughs> get party. Oh, I, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spoke a hookah. Okay. <laughs> Well, you you got you got that guy on on PBS who's 
who's uh, make, saying a lot of great things about that Piedmont area. I don't remember his name. He's marvelous. Um, Are you talking about Patrick McMillan? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Patrick got a job at Heronswood Garden in C outside of Seattle now. Oh. So he's gone from here. But uh, he's a really good teacher and a really good speaker and a good, good botanist. Yeah. He, oh, he's just kind of a good all around naturalist. But you know, like most botanists, he's got his weird thing going too. So, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen a program of his lately, but I, I think he became director of Her Herodswood Garden. So he's got a lot of um, stuff on his plate right now, but he's done a lot of good work. He really has. He's real. I really enjoyed him. I do see him on TV once in a while. So maybe they're showing, you know, older, um, you know, segments or, but he was great. And you turned me on to him, Dixie. It was really entertaining and learn a lot from him yeah yeah he doesn't dumb down his show a, a whole lot you know he'll come out and actually use nomenclature whoa whoa and and that's good and he kind of tries to you know he he, he zeroes in on a lot of details but then he brings you out to the big picture so yeah he's 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 an entertaining guy he was a good teacher too yeah that's one thing i noticed with him i think he'd be a, a very good model when you, uh, for a lot of these situations, like including these community things that you were, what, what you're talking about at CoQuest, all this stuff, you're dealing with people at all these different levels. Uh, um, and it, it can make a, a big difference to have a model for, of someone on how to, how to do that. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's really tough. And you bring a speaker in who can't do that. It's not, it's, it's a challenge to make it work for everybody. Um, sometimes the person who brings the speakers in can help make that happen. But I think for the, for, to help the, uh, to help, to help these community efforts work, it's worth being aware of, of someone like him. I mean, watch him on TV, learn from him, you know, mm -hmm. you're right. You're right. Dixie, I have a question when you mentioned, uh, the fires and brittle bush. So were there, was there a lot of establishment there before, and then it didn't come back? after the fires or you know well actually there was brittle bush there but santan mountains had a really bad spate of arson in the early 90s i think there was a fire that was caused act accidentally by two children playing at a mine or something like that oh, but the ranger told me that one day there were six different fires set in different places throughout the park so after a fire Brittle bush is kind of like the colonizing plant, but it's so prolific in, set, in setting seed. You know, it doesn't live long, but it's a prolific seed setter. So when it establishes these colonies, hey, they can live for 25, 30 years, you know. It, it would be fun for me to go back and kind of peek around the Santans and see, well, is, you know, is what I read right? I mean, are they still there? You know, it's kind of like when you go to campus, um, you know, I haven't really, you know, ratted around ASU campus, but I would kind of like to see the changes. You know, I've been gone from these places in, in quite a while. So, yeah, yeah, I was thinking that when you were talking about, I'm like, I might have to make a trip out there to the Santan and see. We did an eco quest uh, last summer with all the wildfire flow, flow, fires. Wow, tired <laughs> <laughs> with all the wildfires that happened last season, and we were looking at that. We we're thinking, okay, what's coming back what's not and you know we've been talking about that a lot and really want to get that information out there this year as well ahead of time you know to prevent as much as we can but yeah just thinking about brittle bush and then ambrosia coming back and that's a big one too yeah. <laughs> so i wonder if it would be all those now or what it would look like so we'll have to go out there yeah well when we when we collected out there you'd go through this giant slope of brittle bush and then you'd have these choya skeletons so all you'd have is like these skeletons and brittle bush and the skeletons and brittle bush so it, it was kind of surreal you know um sometimes when you come up upon these these colonies that do their thing um yeah i'd be curious to find out you know how developed now the area around the santans is you know i mean i haven't you know do you guys know anything about that It's pretty developed. 
because that it, isn't that area near uh, the town of Queen Creek, Dixie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And apparently Queen Creek, I, I gave a talk there a year or so ago, and they were saying how it's really grown and developed a lot. Oh. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's people for you. <laughs> so it makes these things even more worthwhile, right? So we know mm -hmm. what was there before. Well, yeah. Well, that's why, you know, what you guys are doing is really important because, you know, I imagine to keep certain, you know, certain processes in check, certain plants that have their own ideas and, and are really good adapters to try to keep them in check or at least inventory them, you know, that's a, a really good thing because when people move in, of course, it's disturbed and then newer disturbance plants come in and then party down and then you've got another, you know, stink net on your hands. Yeah. Have you, have you guys ever, since you're looking for things in your floras, have you guys ever come across Kleeberg's blue stem, Dicanthium annulatum or anything like that? It's like an introduced grass. Does that ring a bell? Not that I've seen, I can look it up and see if anyone's seen it on iNaturalist really quick. Did you say dicanthum? Dicanthium? Dicti, you're not getting stink net in South Carolina, are you? No. Uh -uh. Well, what made you bring it up? Are you aware of how bad it is here in Arizona? Oh, yeah. I, I found the first stink net. That's my claim to fame. Oh, that's right. I wanted to <laughs> mention that. I totally that? forgot. <laughs> Dixie, where did you find it at? I found it, you know, on, on kind of on the road to Lake Pleasant or something, out in a Tonto somewhere. I went out with, with a couple of people in Tonto, and there was just one of these plants, and I didn't know what it was. So, of course, I collected it, and I had it in a terrestrial ecosystems herbarium for, I guess, about a year or so before anybody even asked about it. But by that time, it was all over the place, man. Oh, it was, it's unbelievable how yeah. it's all over. Yeah, yeah. I in don't fact, see any of it, the... It popped up in my yard. I sure didn't plant it, so... <laughs> I don't see any of that grass, Dixie. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. It's, it's, it's a voracious, um, invasive plant. I mean, it's chewed up big hunks of the Chihuahua Desert. So I just wondered if, you know, hmm. we collected it. I'm mentioning the reason I'm mentioning it. Um, we collected it right outside of ASU campus, like on University and Mill somewhere. And, and I think Richard Felger was was trying to find, you know, when he was alive, he was trying to kind of document, you know, how fast it was going, things like that. Dixie, Tom Gatz wants to know what year your Stinknet collection was. Oh, I don't, whoa, 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 I don't know. It was early. Oh, Does this, did was... you work, go out with uh, Tatanta with Chris Trask when you found it? Because I know Chris told me he found it many years ago out there. I thought maybe was, it would be, that might stir your memory, but no. Was it, was it before 72? No, not before 72. No. Yeah, I think it, you know. No, not 72, man, because then I'd just be a little kid. Right. Was it? I can't remember the date. You know, I need, I, I'm a horrible numbers person. But I think when Dr. Landrum did the, you know, plants of note or something and talked about the invasion of stink nest, I mean, I think my specimen was the earliest one he could find in Arizona. I so, say we could probably look it up and sign it and I'll send it out with the email if I find it. Yeah, I'm always finding uh, first that have kind of dubious names. I had stink net, then I uh, found a state record for a bladder wart. So it's like, oh no, that's your uh, legacy. <laughs> yes, yes, I feel like Pepe Le Pew. Do you are you do you, are you aware of um, policies in your state that might be something we can learn from here? I mean, here uh, we the the Oh, noxious weed list was just recently updated after many years of not being touched. Um, uh, political stupidity. But, you know, now that it's so, there's all the public, whoever would care, most of them have, haven't heard of it, haven't had it brought to mind. So it's not just being made aware of Stinknet right now, but being made aware of the whole concept 
um, you know, outside of circles like this. I, I'm, I'm wondering, if you might have things to share that might be helpful. Well, in South Carolina, there happens to be something that I call the equivalent of a SWAT team for invasive plants. Um, when I worked at Clemson IDing um, uh, plants for the uh, plant problem clinic, okay, there is a team of uh, botanists, actually they're not really botanists, they're plant killers, it's what they are, mm -hmm. that go out and if you find a documented plant on the list, they will go out and they will kill it. And it's, it's funded by the state because agriculture here is, is the biggest industry, right? So um, they go out, you know, but they have to have this plant ID'd by a, a registered botanist before they actually go out and, and nuke things. But when they do nuke things, I can tell you, it's not very nice. They use all sorts of, you know, really nasty chemicals and everything's dead. So, you know, I'm not sure if you could learn from that. It'd be nice to have this kind of SWAT team that was really concerned about what comes in, but they, they deal with it in a hardcore way. Yeah, they do. Well, then you might... I don't know if you're aware of John Schering and work he's been doing around the around the Tucson area, but instead of just nuking there, they go out in a, in a restoration way. And, and but people, when people hear about it, they think it's just oh, he's just killing, but he's it's not at all. And and there's to, it's a very 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 um, by by now well documented progress. Uh, um, you know, it, it's been buffalo grass mostly so far. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the way to do it, really. I mean, we yeah. had a problem with kudzu, right? You know, that's our, our scourge. And actually, Chinese privet, I, should, I shouldn't call mm -hmm. it that. I should say Ligustum sinense. Um, but um, they, teams would get in and pull it out, but they wouldn't restore it, right? So what would move in? They'd pull out the kudzu and then poison ivy and English ivy and everything else, you know, would just grow right back. But you're right, the way to do it is to eliminate the bad plants, but you really have to restore it with some good native colonizing plants or, you know, you're just kind of, you know, throwing it away. So, yeah. yeah. Hey, Dixie? Yes, what Wendy? Was, what was that species? Is it dicanthium? Dicanthium, di di dicanthium. Annulatum. 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 Okay. Annulatum. A grass, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. I think they call it Clayberg's blue stem or something like that. I'm wondering because uh, when Lucas Majeur was at the garden, for, he was collecting a whole bunch of different species in the genus around Phoenix for somebody else. And I, I, I'm going to look up to see if we have. Was he collecting okay. it for uh, um, Feldman? Richard Feldman? You know, I don't know who he was collecting for. Someone out of state, Florida, maybe? Mm. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Look. yeah. Thanks, though, Dixie. Gosh. It's so great to see you guys. It really is. And it's so great to talk to people that like to talk about plants. You know, the Desert Botanical Garden is really, really lucky because you have all these people that talk about plants. Right now, I've been the curator of a brand newly moved herbarium with a huge compactor that's got like, you know, you know, 20 or 30 more empty cabinets that I can fill up. But there aren't any more plant people. Nobody teaches plant tax or anything like that. So believe wow. you me, I'm the lonely botanist. I am. Wow. We've got a great botanical garden on campus. We've got the state's botanical garden on our campus. So there's potential there. But I'm just waiting for my department to really, they're, they're in the process of hiring a plant tax teacher that's also going to be the herbarium curator. So we're trying to remedy that. But, you know, I miss banter about botany with real botanists. I do. Maybe we'll have to set up a bi-monthly Zoom chat with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I misspoke. There actually is dicanthium. Uh, there's six observations and I naturalist. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. At least it's of only annulum? six, I guess. Uh-huh. Of annulatum. Mm -hmm. There's a dicanthelium annulum. Okay. Dicanthelium is a different 
genus. Yeah, there's a tag champion, uh, and I can tell you. I'll put this uh, link in the chat. This is a map with observations on iNaturalist if you want to check it out. Yeah. Looks like it's all pretty much in the same area near Sun City. Oh, I bet. Well, you know that it, you know that the first collection of it was at Biosphere 2. No way. <laughs> yeah, no way. <laughs> That's funny. You collected it, yeah, in Tempe. Yeah, on Millen University, I think, if I can remember way back when. Yep, Mill, <laughs> Millen University, you got it. Hmm. In the, it says Hell Strip. Oh, yeah, that little strip <laughs> of land between the sidewalk and the street. <laughs> the Hell Strip, huh? That's a terminology. I'm adding That's that to my vocabulary. <laughs> landscape terminology, uh, yeah. Take a look at this guy. Interesting. Wow, very cool. Okay. Mm, ooh, new grass. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm sure Liz knows about that, right? <laughs> Anything's an improvement with me and grasses. Good Lord. You know what? Grasses are a walk in the park compared to sedges. Oh my. Oh God. Yeah, that's true. Yes. I'm walking the park, but Crummy <laughs> 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 Park, huh? <laughs> uh, all right, everyone. Well, thank you. Dixie, thank you so much for being here tonight. We appreciate your time and congratulations on completing your first Zoom presentation. Oh, you were phenomenal. God. I'm so cutting bullets, you guys. Thank you so much for your you did patience. Great. Putting up with me. I appreciate it. <laughs> I miss you all. Love so you, nice Dixie. Good to see you. I think I speak for everyone when I say we appreciate your work and what it means for Ecoflora. And thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. I'm so looking forward to all of our discoveries this year and the fun that we're gonna have. Take care. Thank you. Bye, thanks, Jenny. Bye. Hi to David, Dixie. You too, win! Love you! Bye! Bye. 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 Bye.